Welcome to today's Power of Knowing webinar, part one of a two-part dementia series. Many patients, families, and caregivers have questions and concerns about how to best navigate a dementia diagnosis and ongoing care. Today's topic will discuss available dementia-related resources, education, and advocacy opportunities. In addition, we will discuss how to access these resources. This free webinar is part of a series called The Power of Knowing, created by AuthoriCare Collective, which empowers people to be active participants in their care journey, enabling them to live on their own terms through personalized support for mind, body, and spirit. To get us started, please welcome our moderator, Risa Hanno. Risa serves as clinical and community educator at AuthoriCare Collective and is also a member of the Cone Health Ethics Committee. She is a licensed clinical social worker. Risa, we turn it over to you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you and welcome. It's my pleasure to introduce our panel members for today. First joining us is Lisa Levine. She is the Director of Education for the Dementia Alliance of North Carolina and is responsible for educational outreach through workshops, conferences, and health and wellness education. Lisa has been doing this work for 30 years and continues to work towards improving the quality of life for people living with cognitive impairment and dementia. Next joining us is Karen Owens. Karen works with the Greensboro Office of the Alzheimer's Association as the Education and Family Services Manager. Karen works in various roles, including providing community education programs, assisting with the 24-hour helpline, providing care consultations, and helping to train the support group facilitators and community educators. Welcome. And Nicole Reynolds. Nicole has been the lead navigator with Wellspring Solutions since 2016 and has been with Wellspring since 2008 in different social services roles. Nicole is dedicated to serving the adult population and their caregivers. And Dora Sampimpong. Dora is retired from North Carolina State University, where she worked for 34 years as the microbiology laboratory manager and also a public health specialist with the Center for Outreach in Alzheimer's Aging and Community Health. Dora has been the primary caregiver for five family members with dementia or cognitive decline and is passionate about assisting caregivers in their caregiving journey. Welcome and thank you to each of you for participating in our webinar today. We wanna know some about the participants, you who are joining us for our time together this afternoon. And so we have two polling questions that you will see come up on your Zoom screen. If you will take a moment to answer those, it lets us know a little bit about who is joining us. The first polling question is who is joining us? Care, are you a caregiver to someone with dementia, a healthcare professional, a human service professional, a spiritual care guide? It is a multiple choice question because we know so many have multiple roles and we appreciate you taking a moment to answer that question. When we are not able to gather in person, the ability to use the polls is always very helpful. So thank you for doing that. And we'll just take a moment and look at, wow, 67% of those joining us today are a caregiver for someone with dementia. A large percentage are also healthcare professionals along with human service professionals and spiritual care guides. Thank you very much. We have a second polling question. Those of you who are caring for a person with dementia, 
We wanted to know whether you are a family member friend, a professional caregiver, or perhaps both, recognizing again that many people are doing many things um, at the same time. So thank you for participating in that. And we will go ahead and see the results of that. Wow, 81% um, of those who are providing care are family members, friends, and a, a good percentage are both. Um, also a professional caregiver in addition to being a friend or family member. So thank you. This is why we knew that this topic is so important. We are going to have a really meaningful conversation. I invite the participants to make use of the question and answer bubble on the Zoom screen. You can submit a question at any time and we will try to answer as many of those as we can. I also wanna mention that we're gonna be talking about resources and we will be sending an email tomorrow that will have not only a recording of today's webinar, but it will include links to the different resources that we mentioned. So you do not need to take notes <laughs> during our time together, but you can be a part of our conversation. So with that, Karen, um, when we think about dementia, we know that um, there are different kinds of dementia and some of us have a different understanding of dementia. Can you give us an overview of what dementia is and also some of the different types and how we find out information about those different types of dementia? Sure, I'm happy to. And that's a great question because many have that question. I get that a lot in the community because it can be a little confusing. Um, to hear those words interchangeably. So when we think about the word dementia, that is a broad term that we use to describe a set of symptoms where somebody's experiencing cognitive decline that's severe enough to interfere in their daily functioning. So we also call it an umbrella term because so many things fall under that umbrella. So dementia is the word we use to describe the symptoms of all the different types of dementia. And then there are multiple different types. Alzheimer's disease is the most common type. It accounts for 60 to 80% of the cases. Um, but then there are other types too, such as vascular dementia or frontotemporal dementia, or you also may hear that being uh, a, a term being used, frontotemporal lobar degeneration, um, or FTD for short. There's also other types of dementia. Um, including what we call mixed dementia. And that's where somebody can have more than one type of dementia at the same time. Um, the most common mixture we see is Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Um, so if you hear that term mixed dementia, that's what they're referring to. Somebody has more than one type of dementia. Um, but there are certainly, like I said, a lot of other types of dementia. There's dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, there's dementia associated with other neurological diseases such as Huntington's. Um, so there's quite a few different types of dementia that fall under um, that dementia umbrella. And as far as accessing information about Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia, um, there are a lot of great resources out there. Um, we have quite a few on the panel here today, including the Alzheimer's Association, which is, um, where I work, and we have a lot of information about Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia on our website, um, which is alz.org. We also have a lot of information that can be received by calling our 24-hour helpline, which is 1-800-272-3900, and that's where individuals can talk with one of my colleagues at our helpline um, and ask questions, get additional information about um, various types of dementia, but also about specific things related to what their need is, because we know everybody's journey in regards to various types of dementia differs, um, both the individual living with the disease, but also every family's journey differs. So they can call our helpline and talk with 
um, one of my colleagues about whatever their need may be um, or question that they may have or concern. Um, so there's a, a lot of information that can be gathered from our helpline as well as on our website. Um, and we also nationwide have a lot of different education programs that are offered. Um, we have virtual education programs that are being offered and then some programs have uh, are being offered in person. Of course, following CDC um, guidelines or recommendations, but so individuals can access that information um, either virtually through our education programs in person or we also have um, e-learning workshops that individuals can access on our website too um, about a variety of topics. Um, so there's a lot of information that can be found on there about Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia. Um, and then too, you know, individuals learn from each other in support groups. Um, we have a number of support groups and that information can be accessed on our website or by calling our helpline number. Um, as well as education offerings can be accessed both ways too. But we have some specialty support groups like two FTD support groups. We have two male caregiver support groups. Um, we have an African-American support group. And we have a support group for individuals living with younger onset Alzheimer's disease. So that's where they have started experiencing symptoms prior to the age of 65. Um, and so there are quite a few specialty support groups and then caregiver support groups as well, general caregiver support groups as well. And individuals can access that information um, online as well as by calling our helpline number, we can certainly get individuals registered that way to, to attend the support groups. And we have support groups nationwide. So let me put that out there, not just for North Carolina, but we have support groups nationwide. Um, where individuals can connect with others and have the opportunity to learn from each other. Um, because, you know, sometimes we don't always think of everything, especially whenever we're in the midst of a situation. And so sometimes connecting with others can provide us some insight, um, you know, when, from somebody outside the situation. Um, so individuals can certainly get information that way as well. Um, and we also have what's called Alls Connected, which is an online platform for individuals living with the disease and for caregivers to connect with others through an online um, or web-based platform. So that's another opportunity where individuals can connect, get support from each other, and certainly get information from each other. Um, and I will say another tool that we have is Alls Navigator, which is great. It is, it develops a personalized caregiving action plan for individuals with tips and resources. And that's a tool that we have on our website too, where folks can, um, you know, get information because you're creating that personalized plan. Um, and we also have a virtual library. So that's available to folks all across the US, um, our virtual library as well. Um, and we also have what's called e-news where you can sign up to get updates, stories, resources, great information. Um, and that comes out too if folks want to sign up for e-news. So we have quite a variety of ways where individuals can get information and also connect with others um, and get support as they navigate this journey. Wonderful, thank you. I, um, Karen mentioned um, navigators. And so Nicole, um, we know that that is your role. And can you talk to us some about the, the role of a navigator and how a navigator might be helpful, or helpful for the person with dementia and their caregiver? Yeah, so um, each organization I think has a, a bit of a different definition as far as what a navigator can do, but I think the word speaks for itself. And, and um, for our organization, our goal is to educate and connect folks to resources that may be helpful. And we meet with people that maybe just got a diagnosis, or I've met with people that recently moved to the area and aren't familiar with um, our location and what's available in the community. So my goal is always to educate and connect. So 
So make sure that they have um, a list of resources that might be helpful to them now or down the road as their disease progresses and their needs change. Um, and to kind of get a feel for assessing the situation, what are their current needs, um, or you know, what are their goals for the future? They want to age in place. Are they interested in learning more about care options in the community? Um, so just making sure that they are armed with um, resources that can be helpful to them as they start their journey or um, are in the middle of their journey. And I've met with folks, you know, towards the end, trying to figure out what next steps are. Um, and then, you know, certainly there's navigators um, that are more hands-on and um, kind of hold hold care managers um, that help the family through the process um, in a more detailed manner um, where they actually help them develop a plan and um, help them through the process of accessing services when the time is right. So a navigator can be a lot of different things, but I think the most important part is educating and then making sure that they access those services that will be most helpful to them. Thank you. That, that is so helpful because we, we want people to be aware of resources and where to turn. And so Lisa, um, that topic of resources and support is really big and broad, but if I don't know how to connect with a resource or the type of resources that are out there, then um, I'm not going to receive what I need. So talk to us some about how we make best use of resources, find out about them, and some understanding of resources in addition to what Karen and, and Nicole have already shared. Thanks, Risa. Well, we do have um, a great number of resources, both nationally and local to North Carolina, which is wonderful for all of us. And we, we've heard a lot from Karen and those are national resources and from Nicole and those are more local resources. Um, Want to remind everyone that there is an area agency on aging um, in every state and they're broken up by regions and they all have uh, family support programs. So there's a family support person in every area agency on aging in your area, in your town, wherever you are. Of course, the Alzheimer's Association is a national organization that people can reach out to wherever they are as well. There are also local organizations such as Dementia Alliance of North Carolina where I work and we help people across the state of North Carolina with dementia related issues. Um, there's other organizations as well that are disease specific. So uh, while the Alzheimer's Association and Dementia Alliance of North Carolina help anybody dealing with any type of dementia, there is the Association for Frontotemporal Temporal Degeneration or AFTD and they are FTD specific. There's also LBDA, lots of acronyms here, but that's the Lewy Body Dementia Association. And I know in the email that everyone will get later, you'll have all these resources for them, but there are some specific ones for those um, dementias that people may not be as familiar with. There are a lot of other resources out there and how do you know where to turn? You get a diagnosis, what do you do? Um, well, it kind of depends sometimes on what you're looking for, um, but we know there's online resources, phone resources, Zoom resources now like this. We want people to try and find someone they connect with, someone they relate to, and then hopefully uh, they have that care navigator, like they call Nicole, they form that connection with Nicole and Nicole can get them where they want throughout their journey of dementia, whether it be early on or later on. Um, so a lot of things that are out there such as resource referral are really important, respite. YouTube can be a great informational tool for videos. Um, for example, Dementia Alliance has a YouTube channel with a lot of videos on a lot of different topics as well. There are um, support groups, as Karen mentioned, and um, 
those can be divided up depending on disease. Often we can find those by county location. Sometimes people can even reach out to their faith organization and find those support. So if you're not sure where to start often, your faith organization is a great place to go. Um, it depends too, I, I know Dora's gonna speak some on advocacy, but if someone really wants to make a difference, they can go to clinicaltrials.gov and get involved in clinical trials and really make a difference and show that they're still living with dementia and living their best life by making a difference. So um, they need to reach out, people need to reach out to one of these trusted resources that we have on this call today and anyone can help them navigate those resources specifically to what their current needs are. Thank you so much. Um, I wanna remind our participants that you can submit a question through the question and answer box at any time. Um, and we will try to answer those as we continue on. Dora, um, you have been a caregiver for multiple people over the years. And I know personally that you are a strong advocate, not just for those that you provide care for, but for all caregivers. But not everybody knows what it means to be an advocate um, or feels equipped to be an advocate for those that we are caring for and about. So tell us some about being an advocate, what that means in the setting of caring for someone with dementia. Dora, unmute yourself so we can hear what you'll share with us. Perfect. Okay, I just knew I wouldn't have to be reminded, <laughs> but I did. Anyway, it's just a pleasure to be here today. Anytime that I can be in a position to help other caregivers, because I know how difficult, how tough it really is. And I just want to encourage everyone listening, whether you are a caregiver or not, Former First Lady Rosalind Carter stated that there are four kinds of people, people who at one time were caregivers, people who currently are caregivers, people who in the future will become caregivers and people who will be cared for. So everyone participating today in this webinar, okay, this information is for you. And I really want to encourage you to really be an advocate, but what is an advocate? Okay, an advocate is a person who steps in, especially for a person who has a dementia diagnosis, steps in and speaks up for that person, okay? Now, all of these rep who are represented here today have shared with you what their organization can do for you. So I, want to advise you to please reach out to these organizations. The Alzheimer's Association is a national organization. If you are locally, reach out to these lo local organizations. They all have helped me. They have helped my family in our caregiving journey. Okay, I started caring for my father in the 90s who had, a, who had cognitive decline and he had other health issues. Then I took care of my aunt, who also, she actually had an Alzheimer's diagnosis. Okay, that was my father's sister. Then I cared for my mother for 10 years, who had an Alzheimer's diagnosis. I cared for her at home. My sister cared for her for eight years prior to that time until she could no longer do it because she had to have hand surgery. Now I'm currently caring for two sisters. One has an Alzheimer's diagnosis, actually the one who cared for my mother for eight years. She was diagnosed about three years ago. I also care for another sister, my oldest sister, who has cognitive decline and other health issues. So, so it is very difficult to be a, an advocate. I will say you need an advocate. If you are caring for someone, with dementia, you definitely need an advocate. And we have organizations represented here. I will tell you briefly how they all helped me, everyone here. 
starting with the Alzheimer's Association. I was one, was one of those who was trained in caregiver support group facilitation. I was trained by the Alzheimer's Association and I have participated in their walks. I have learned so much during this journey of caregiving. And then there's the um, Dementia Alliance of North Carolina. I, I have participated in some of their events. And don't mention <laughs> Nicole. <laughs> Oh my, you have been such a help, such a help. Your organization, such a help. Wellsprings Solution, Wellsprings Solutions. My sister actually participated in the Memory Care Center for a couple of years until she moved in with my sister. Both of them are living in independent living in an apartment. They are being cared for there by me. I'm still a caregiver. They have professional caregivers, but I have to manage all of that, manage their care. I have to be an advocate because someone with dementia, they many times cannot speak up for themselves. This week, I took my sister who has dementia to see a spine specialist. She was diagnosed about three years ago, but she still remembers a lot. She was able to answer questions. It's very important to involve that person, not to speak to the doctor as if they're not there, but you involve that person, but you add information that's left out. And then you're able to also ask pertinent questions of the doctor. So it's very important to be an advocate and you can be an advocate by reaching out to community organizations. Fabulous, thank you. Um, the, the passion in your voice coupled with the knowledge that you bring to the topic is just spectacular. Um, all of our panelists, I, I've been watching, we've gotten a, a number of questions come in and Nicole, um, I was going to ask you the first one. Somebody was asking about, um, financial resources other than Medicaid to assist with care. Um, particularly in the home, are there resources? I, I can imagine that questions around finances and paying for care is, is a common need and question. Yes, it certainly is. I think a misconception that most people have is that their Medicare is going to pay for whatever they need when they get older. It's going to help cover in-home care services or going to a facility. And unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, so with in-home care services specifically, um, within our area and our county, um, Department of Social Services has some grant funds um, to offer uh, support in the home. It's in-home respite. Um, you know, there typically is a waiting list for that service, and uh, I think they will typically cover about 15 hours of service a week and focus on whatever that individual's needs might be. Um, if it's somebody that might need assistance with um, meals or like housekeeping or somebody that needs help with a shower, um, they would develop a plan of care that, you know, would meet that individual's needs. Um, so I would encourage you, whether you're local in Guilford County or in your own county, to connect with your Department of Social Services to find out what grant funds they might offer to help with those types of services. And then um, Senior Resources of Guilford is also another local agency, um, but I know there are agencies throughout the country that offer vouchers for caregivers. And um, that could be, um, I think, around $500 for them to be able to use for respite. And so that could be something they use to go on a vacation or to uh, provide assistance for as long as those funds will last um, for in-home care services as well. So that's another um, option available. Um, but typically home care services, unfortunately are an out-of-pocket expense. There's not much um, financially that can assist with that outside of, you know, connecting with Medicaid if somebody qualifies for that. Thank you. Um, there was a, a question that 
somebody was having a lot of concern about um, observing a neighbor who had fallen a number of times and there doesn't seem to be family around. And of course, it's been so hot and asking about a, a next step. And I think um, in my experience as a social worker, I might say, um, contacting adult protective services in the county that you are in. You can do that anonymously, which was part of the, the request of the person submitting the question. So I, I would encourage you to contact the adult protective services organization through the Department of Social Services in the county where, where the person lives. Um, and Karen, I, I see your, your hand is up. So um, was there something you wanted to, to add? I wanted to add to the question about financial resources and thinking about more broad resources. Um, there is a grant through um, Hilarity for Charity and Homestead that can assist with um, in-home care. And, and I will say Hilarity for Charity, they have since changed their name, but individuals can call the Alzheimer's Association's helpline and get that information. Um, that's also a resource available as well as it's really important for individuals if they have a long-term care insurance policy to call and inquire what that policy covers because some in-home, some um, long-term care insurance policies cover in-home care if it is due to cognitive decline. So it's imperative that folks call and check to see what is covered by that policy because for individuals that have one, if that is offered through that policy, that may be a resource that they have to utilize in regards to in-home care. And a lot of individuals are not aware that that might even be an option on their policy um, because they think long-term care, you know, is for long-term care, not necessarily in-home care. So I encourage folks to check their policy um, for what that covers. That can be certainly, if individuals have that a more broad resource as well for, um, for assistance with that, as well as the grant I mentioned. And my apologies for not being able to recall the, the new name for Hilarity for Charity, but we can get you that information. I don't know if, if Lisa might know that new name, but um, we can get that information. So I just wanted to mention that too. Thank you. Um, Lisa, I, I was going to ask you, we've got in a, a number of questions that have a, a similar theme, and it is related to the um, importance of having a current diagnosis. So one question was about um, a family member diagnosed earlier with um, cognitive decline, mild cognitive decline, but is there a reason to go back to the physician, maybe to a neurologist to get uh, another assessment? And, and what is the importance of that? Um, another question of that same theme was, are you less able to access resources if you don't have a definitive diagnosis? And it makes me think about Karen, what you were just saying about accessing long-term care. Um, so Lisa, if you could speak to the importance of diagnosis, updated diagnosis, where we turn for that and some steps. Sure, sure. So um, it is important to have that diagnosis. It's not 100% necessary because any of these agencies that we've talked about Alzheimer's Association, Dementia Alliance, we're going to help you whether you have that actual diagnosis or not. So you can call in and get assisted whether you have that diagnosis. We are going to suggest that you start with your primary care provider and talk with them. And if they don't give you a sufficient answer, you need to advocate, like Dora said. Um, if they just say, oh, you're just getting older, that kind of thing. We need to ask more questions. We need to speak up, whether it be ourselves or for our loved one. Um, and then we do often recommend that someone go and see a neurologist, a geriatrician, someone who has a great deal of experience 
working with people with cognitive impairment. And the reason for that is, well, there's multiple reasons. One is because when you do have a diagnosis, sometimes it can affect insurance and those kinds of things, like Karen mentioned. Um, if it is a specific type of dementia, there might be some um, medication information that you need specifically. For example, if someone has a Lewy body dementia diagnosis, there are certain types of medicine that um, will not work well for them that we want to be sure that, that we're careful of. So it is important to have that information. Now, some people will get a dementia diagnosis and it won't tell us what type. Um, and a lot of people think it's okay just to stop there, but oftentimes we want to see if we can push a little bit more, do a little bit more with our physician, our neurologist, our geriatrician, whoever that may be, to dig a little deeper and get what type of dementia. Um, as Karen mentioned originally, some people think that dementia and Alzheimer's is the same thing. And um, if you have dementia, you might have a number of cognitive issues going on. You may have Alzheimer's, you may have a different type, and it can be beneficial to find out that diagnosis, but not absolutely necessary to get the resources and the information. And Risa, I did want to really quickly piggyback on one thing Nicole said. Uh, Dementia Alliance of North Carolina offers a caregiver um, assistance fund as well. Um, if anyone calls and speaks to our care navigator, they can help them look at all the other respite programs across North Carolina, see if they qualify for them. And then if they don't, sometimes we can help um, with some funding as well for both in-home care and, and other resources as well. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, Dora, there was a, a question, and I think that um, you can speak to this. Someone's really struggling with their mother who just denies that they have a problem, and she does not want to speak to the physician. Um, and how does the daughter or any other family member really um, try to respect that, that loved one and at the same time get information to the healthcare provider? Um, how do we navigate that? And, and the fact that um, we know sometimes people can be angry or defensive and you know just not recognizing the, the problem that they are having. Well, that is really difficult and very challenging, but um... In situations like that, you need to really think through and have a strategy. And one idea is to take the, your loved one to the physician. Now we have routine medical appointments. And so you don't have to address it as, okay, something's going on with you. Something's, maybe you have dementia. You don't have to mention that word, but just, allow the person to go to a regular routine visit and then go from there. You speak with the doctor, slip the doctor a, a note, and you, know, you just don't have to use the D word. So being present, and I would imagine even on a um, virtual or a telehealth visit in this day and age, we might be able to make use of um, like a my chart or an online option of communicating with a physician or a healthcare provider. Um, I'm, I'm mindful of some of the limitations that, that COVID has presented us in terms of being able to go with, um, but the message or it sounds very clear is finding those paths to get information to, to those care providers, to the physicians. Um, and Karen, I know you wanted to, to add something. Just, I wanted to add in regards to the question about um, a diagnosis, there are some situations, I mean, we certainly encourage individuals to seek a diagnosis as early as possible so that they can, um, you know, can better support them in navigating that journey. But there are some situations where it's imperative that individuals have an accurate diagnosis. Um, and as far as financial resources, one of those is 
in regards to social security and disability. There's what's called the Compassionate Allowance Initiative that was put in place ideally to fast track um, an individual's disability when they have been diagnosed with younger onset Alzheimer's disease. So that's one of those situations in regards to the financial resources where it's imperative that there, that a diagnosis um, be accurate and certainly the sooner the better um, so that individuals can utilize that resource, um, you know, in, in addressing their needs. Um, so the Compassion and Allowance Initiative is one of those where it's, it's really important um, and is, can be a financial a support in regards to finances and navigating this journey um, and applying for disability. Um, so I wanted to just make sure folks were aware of that um, because I find that a lot of individuals are not aware that resource is available. Um, so. Nicole, there was a, a question um, from a caregiver saying that she herself has a lot of health conditions and is struggling to provide assistance to someone with dementia and a physician had, you know, um, initiated home health, but that was very, very time limited. So um, not an uncommon story, unfortunately, that you hear. Um, what are some next steps or first steps that you would um, recommend for someone in that situation? So um, there's, there's different options to provide support and respite for caregivers. Um, I can speak to, you know, Wellspring specifically, we have adult day programs, which are a mutually beneficial option for both the caregiver and the um, care recipient because it offers them an opportunity to socialize and be around others, um, potentially have meals and support with care. Um, and, and allow respite for the caregiver. So day programs, which are available across the country, um, ours is dementia specific, but um, there are a lot of adult day care options. I hate calling it daycare, but um, adult day program options available for um, that are not disease specific. Um, and then in-home care services is another option uh, to provide assistance within the home. Um, Home health is very specific as far as, you know, therapy services, maybe skilled nursing, but it's short term. Um, so developing a plan as far as in-home services or a, an adult day program would be options that could be helpful um, to provide some support. Um, but we see a lot of situations where, um, you know, it might be a couple that are caring for each other or a family member that also has medical issues. So having some support whether that be um, a day program, in-home care, um, you know, definitely those are some options to look into if that individual is interested in remaining at home. Um, and there's also a program called PACE, um, which is also, I think nationally, we have one locally here um, that provides all-inclusive care um, for adults that want to remain in the home. And that's a Medicare, Medicaid funded program as well that can be helpful to provide support. Great. Um, I wanted Karen to come back to you. Somebody asked a clarifying question about what you had mentioned with the Compassionate Fund, whether the question is whether that's Guilford County, that's state, that's national. Can you um, give us a little more detail on that? Sure. Um, I know it's I know it's definitely North Carolina. I think it's national as well. Um, so when applying for Social Security, you know, I know COVID has changed things as far as how we um, complete applications and submit things for resources. Um, and I know that there is an online application for disability, but we um, certainly have encouraged folks in the past pre-pandemic, let me say, to go in um, and do that, um, apply for disability in person. Um, and make sure that you're utilizing that uh, language and ask for the Compassionate Allowance Initiative. Um, I know for certain it's North Carolina, um, and I think I, I think it's nationally, but I can try to find out and get that information to you. Okay. Lisa, I see you nodding. Um, 
and Dora. I, yeah. Yes, um, I'd like to add to add some information with regards to getting an accurate diagnosis because sometimes there can be other things going on medically that can make it appear as though the person has dementia. So it's, it's very important not to just uh, walk away after the doctor says it's probably dementia. That's what happened with my mother at first. But my sister went ahead and had my mother go through the battery of tests to rule out everything. So that's very important. Thank you, that, that is wonderful. Um, I think all of you can, can answer this um, question and, and I think I know the answer, but I wanna be sure, which is whether somebody needs to um, have a provider make a referral to your organizations or whether a caregiver, family member, friend, um, or even the person with dementia can initiate a referral themselves. Um, there is not a need for a physician or a provider referral for and Lisa, I see you saying that is true, Karen and Nicole. So it really is the, the person who either has the diagnosis themselves or the caregiver can access any and all of the resources that, that we have been talking about, um, which is part of that advocacy role um, that Dora has really highlighted for us. Um, another question about the Compassionate Alliance Initiative only for those before age 65. I know you mentioned it was related to early onset um, dementia. So, and dis, uh, disability is often related to those who do not yet qualify for Medicare. So we are talking about that under 65 age. Um, somebody else has asked whether we have any insight to the um, what might be included in the elder care services um, portion of the um, infrastructure bill that is now being considered. Um, I, I don't know the details and you know I'm always reluctant until we see the final product to know exactly what might be available. I don't know if any of the panelists have anything else that um, you would want to contribute about that. Um, other than that, we will watch it very closely and hope that, that there are resources um, involved. Um, so I am being mindful of time. There's one last question and um, it is whether there are any experiences um, related to alcohol and Alzheimer's. I'm not quite sure if there, the question is whether there's a, a correlation, a link between the two or Aaron, I see you nodding. So I'll, I'll toss it over to you. There can be, and I say that because there is a type of dementia that is related to, um, or can be related to a long history of um, significant alcohol use. Um, and that's wernicke korsoff syndrome. Um, so it can be. Um, our time is flying by. Um, and I, I want to take a moment and, and kind of go around to each of, each of you. Um, what is one pearl, one takeaway, one, you know, if you remember nothing else from our time together, that you would want to share with our panelists. I, I want to be sure that, that we give each of you that opportunity um, before we end today. And, and Lisa, I'm going to ask you to share something. Hard to pick only one. <laughs> um, I, would, I would say join a support group, find a support group. You're not in this alone and uh, take care of yourself while you're taking care of your person living with dementia as well. If you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of them. Thank you. And Nicole? Um, I agree with what Lisa just said. It's very important to, to take care of yourself as a caregiver, because again, yeah, you, you're not gonna be much help if you're not caring for yourself. 
Um, but I think one thing we never hear people say, um, I, I called you too soon. So, um, you know, we encourage caregivers and um, care recipients to reach out to resources. It's never too soon to start talking about what's available and what can be helpful. Um, unfortunately, we hear more often than not, I wish I'd called you sooner. So don't, you know, let fear keep you from, from accessing resources and reaching out to people um, because the more knowledge that you have, the, the better you're equipped to deal with things as they come up um, throughout the process. And yes, join a support group for sure. Thank you. Karen, what would you have us take away from this time together? You're on mute. <laughs> would certainly um, just reiterate self-care that's imperative because um, it is hard to take care of others if we're not taking care of ourselves and unfortunately we know caregivers experience burnout a lot of times um, and just the disease in that journey and caregiving journey can take a toll on our caregivers health um, so that but also to you know just reach out to someone you know, reach out and it's, it's okay to ask for help um, because, you know, this is not a journey that um, is easily navigated alone. And so I would just encourage folks to ask for help, reach out to the resources, regardless of where you are, there are resources in your community. Um, so please, please reach out, ask for help. Thank you. And Dora. Yes, I would like to share, and I forgot to mention that um, what AuthorCare did for us, for our family, even though AuthorCare is not just about the end of life, hospice care, they help you along your journey, but they were very impactful to our family. Uh, during the pandemic, they provided excellent hospice care for us. I wouldn't have known what to do, but how can the, that journey be pleasant, but it was as pleasant as it could possibly be with the help of authority care. And I will say one last thing is that those listening become an ambassador so that not only you, those who are attending this webinar, but extend this information, share this information to friends, families, members, uh, church family members, pastors, whomever in your community, so that they will also learn what you learned today. Thank you. And thank you for mentioning AuthorCare Collective. Um, you know, AuthorCare Collective does provide hospice services and certainly a number of patients under our care do have a dementia diagnosis. Um, oftentimes some of the different ones that we have mentioned. Also, we care for many patients with a dementia diagnosis in our palliative care program as well. Um, and certainly as a part of that care continuum. So I, I appreciate you, you mentioning that Dora as another resource. Um, certainly as people approach the end of what can often be a very long care journey. Um, I would share a, a pearl, which is that we are going to continue our conversation next week. And so I, I want to encourage everyone to um, participate in our webinar next week. And you can see on your screen that it is entitled How and Where to Provide Care for the Person with Dementia and Their Caregivers. And this conversation will include panelists, um, someone who has been a nursing home administrator, um, an another representative from Dementia Alliance of North Carolina. Um, it's gonna be a, a very wonderful and rich conversation um, that will have our panelists being able to share information um, and included on that panel is Dr. Carter, who is one of our 
physicians from Athara Care Collective. So I hope that um, as many people as possible will be able to join us for that conversation. Um, I want to, I see Karen, um, before we close, has shared that Compassionate Alliance Initiative um, applies to filing for social security disability, regardless of state, which is a, a wonderful update for us. Um, and to say to all of our participants that have registered for this webinar, you will get an email. That email will probably come out tomorrow. It will have a recording of our webinar. So you can go back and listen to all of the, the wonderful conversation and mention of the different um, resources. It will also have a listing of links to the different resources. And it will also give you the ability to respond back to that email and it will come to me. And if you have a question that we were not able to get to today, I will um, try to get you that answer as soon as possible and, and respond to you so that we get as much information um, to you as quickly as possible. Um, so I want to thank each one of you. You bring just amazing knowledge, but also empathy to this work, which I know can be so challenging. And so many people are in tremendous need and you are able to truly guide people in a direction that is so necessary. So um, I appreciate um, you all for participating and more so for the work that you do each day in our community. Um, I wanna close with a reading. Um, we don't know who wrote it. It is unattributed, but it is called When Goodbye Begins, Concentrate on Where You Are Now, and plan on what your next step will be. Then accept that sometimes that step will not work out, will not be possible. Tomorrow isn't here yet and you have survived yesterday. Um, and with that, I will say thank you again. Please look for that email, register to join us. Um, next Thursday as we continue our conversation. And thank you all for participating with us today. Thank you.